Okay, well, let's get back started. This is um, the second session, and uh, this morning, I'm going to follow Pastor Rick's lead by sitting here <laughs> rather than getting behind the pulpit. I, I like this format, so we're going to be re- nice and relaxed this morning. Um, we want to talk about uh, practical implications of headship, authority, and maybe we'll touch a little bit on submission this morning, but practical implications of headship and authority. And this is um, you know, really the first of multiple cornerstone intensives that we have this year. Uh, we had made plans at our planning meeting last uh, October, I think it was, to um, have six or seven all-day Saturday events this year where we take a topic and just as a church family we spend time discussing a topic that we typically don't have the opportunity to discuss during sort of week-by-week exposition uh, in the scripture. Uh, so this is a very important subject. Marriage is extremely Important Husbands and wives would certainly say amen. And uh, so we want to take some time, obviously, and spend some time discussing marriage, the importance of marriage, uh, some helpful, practical uh, things that we can do to have God-honoring, Christ-exalting marriages. Uh, we want to spend some time doing that. But then also, throughout the, years we'll, uh, throughout the year, we'll tackle other subjects as well. I think coming up on April 7th, there is uh, an intensive, all-day intensive on parenting. And I think the parenting emphasis is on kids and technology. Uh, So we have so many little kids running around the church, and um, they'll get to that age where between smartphones and tablets and TVs and games, uh, our kids are just being assaulted, uh, right, by that stuff. And so uh, we want to talk to parents about that as well. So we'll do that April 7th, I believe, mark your calendar for that. And you'll see those dates coming up in the, um, the calendar in the bulletin. Okay, so we are talking about practical implications of headship, and authority, and um, again, like I said, this, this subject extremely important. So you've got a little worship folder there. If you will, take some notes, write some text down. You, know, you want to commit these things to memory, uh, study the text in your daily devotion, spend some time thinking about these things. Uh, it's critical. As Pastor Rick said this morning, you're not applying, like Ephesians chapter 5, for example, to your marriage. You're not going to have a good marriage. Um, really, the importance of theology is that theology is lived in the life of God's people by His Spirit, by His Spirit's help. We're to apply that theology in our marriages to have a marriage that becomes then a picture of Christ and His church, His bride. And so very, very important. Um, to get us started this morning on this subject, uh, last year we uh, discussed how taking personal responsibility, or we discussed resolving conflict and problems um, in your marriage and the importance of taking personal responsibility and solving those, right? Uh, Specifically last year, we discussed how conflict resolution or problems in your marriage um, is not a zero-sum game, right? And what I mean by that is this. Um, If you have a, like, this represents a problem in your marriage, right? or represents a conflict in your marriage. Maybe it represents all of the problems in your marriage, if you want to think about it that way, okay? It's not right to think about it in terms of a zero-sum game. In other words, maybe the couple comes in for counseling, or you're discussing discussing this issue in your marriage, and uh, the husband says, you know what? Um, I have my responsibility for the problem, and my wife has her responsibility for the problem, right? Uh, so let's just, you, you could flip this around easily, couldn't you? Uh, husband says, yeah, maybe, maybe 20% is me, but 80% is her, right? And when we come in for counseling, what the counselor is going to do, he's going to sort that out. He's going to help us. He's going to help her see that, and we're going to get this fixed, and that's going to, you know, make our problems go away. Uh, that's, that's, but un, that's unfortunately not how it works. So, so please continue to listen, Pastor Rick. <laughs> All right. Um, we, we tend to think about it that way, right? She has her problems. I have my problems. A husband is thinking to himself, if I can just get her straightened out over there, or she th- she's thinking to herself, if I can just get him straightened out in this area, that everything's going to work out, everything's going to be fine. And what you get then in that kind of a zero-sum, what what's a zero-sum game? A zero-sum game is when uh, the parts equal 100, or you subtract all the parts, you get zero. Uh, it's one pie chart, right? It's one pie chart. And what you get when you view problems or conflicts in marriage that way is you get blame shifting. You get self-righteous, self-justifying 
blame shifting. What you don't get is you don't get each person in a relationship taking personal responsibility for the problem, right? Uh, a lot of times what you get is spouses, husbands and wives blaming one another. It perpetuates this downward spiral that we talked about last year, right? Where if you're not taking personal responsibility for your contributions to the problem, then it begins this downward spiral that um, if, it, you're, if you're not biblically confronting or biblically resolving conflict, then you see it show up in criticism. And that's step number one. And criticism is when um, you begin to belittle or demean, criticize your spouse, right? Again, it's not my fault, really, at the end of the day. It's her fault. It's not my fault. It's his fault, right? It spirals downward. Rather than biblically dealing with your conflict in love, you don't biblically address sin. You don't lovingly confront sin. You begin to build a case against your husband. You begin to build a case against your wife. Uh, really ungodly, right? Puts your spouse in the position then of being an adversary and not one flesh, a one flesh relationship with you. Right? You begin to be hostile toward one another. Um, resentful, bitterness sets in, anger sets in, uh, unforgiveness, right? You begin using words like always and never. She always, right? Or he never. And you begin to impugn their character. Um, this begins the downward spiral. That is a, if you, if you take stock right now, take stock right now of your relationship. If you've had those kinds of conflicts, either you're currently having them or those been, that's been the nature of your conflict in the past, you're already in this level. Right, you're already in this level. If you've gone past lovingly biblical confrontation, lovingly biblically dealing with sin in your relationship, then you're already on the downward spiral. It's just a matter of where. All right. So if anger is coming to your relationship, resentment, bitterness, unforgiveness, criticism, building a case against your spouse, she always, he never, that those kinds of things are all indications of this. All right. Unchecked criticism leads to the second level and these levels mind you are um they can all be taking place at the same time or you may skip around but the next one is contempt it gets ugly really quick doesn't it contempt you can read my writing sorry i'm going to try to do better this morning contempt unchecked criticism leads to contempt now you're harsh you're hostile you're rolling your eyes right she starts talking, you're like, oh, that's, that's, those are signs of contempt. Um, that hostility breeds in your relationship. Um, you're spiteful. Contempt leads to, this is all by way of review, it leads to counterattack. Counterattack. And here is where you begin and offensive against your spouse. You begin using words that wound, um, maybe actions that harm or wound, right? Maybe the relationship, you get physical, you start bowing up on each other, right? Um, you intentionally use language to harm or to hurt. You know where to press a button, like you know what's going to set him off, and so you put your finger right on it, right? Because you want to. It's, um, it becomes a counterattack. And in this, this relationship, right, in this downwardly spiraling, out of control, ungodly, unbiblical relationship, um, your adversaries, your adversaries now, you're not on the same side, you're not on the same team, your adversaries, and because your adversaries, if you concede an inch, it feels like a loss. It feels like you're losing, I can't lose. I'm not going to let them win one inch, right? I'm going to take it all. I'm going to insist that I win. Husbands really often have a tendency to bulldoze their wives. Wives have a tendency to become uh, very emotionally lashing out at their husbands. Um, that's the way this looks. You're now sort of enemies in the same household, the way you're acting, right? The way that goes. You know, there may be times, right, where um, these things don't take place, but as soon as there's a conflict, you see it, right? You see it, and you see it at one level or another. Counterattacks. Uh, eventually, all of this leads to collapse. So 
So if you can sort of remember the four C's here, if you're not biblically confronting sin, biblically dealing with conflict resolution, then it's very likely you're at one stage or another of this kind of a, an ungodly, unbiblical, unchristlike, sinful spiral. Okay? Uh, collapse is when one or both withdraw. Right? I can't get anywhere with him or her any longer. So I'm going to stop talking. Uh, the person raises something up and it's like, okay, no, honey, I've got to work until 9 o'clock tonight. Sorry, I'm not going to be home. <laughs> right? Or I'm going to go out with the guys tonight. I'm going to go out with the ladies tonight. I'm not going to spend time with you at home. Or a husband retreats to uh, video games until 1130, 12 o'clock at night. Wife goes to bed alone. Husband's out watching TV. Right? Or the wife's, you know, on the computer. Husband goes to bed. You know, it's those, those kinds of things, right? You know what I'm talking about. You can all, you can all sort of imagine um, where these things are prevalent in a relationship, right? Think about maybe uh, your own experience um, in your relationship. My wife and I were married before we were converted, and I was a miserable excuse. I'm not much better now, but I was a miserable excuse for a husband back then. Um, so we have gone through every one of these <laughs> Every one of these levels, so maybe you have too in your married relationship, have seen these before. Um, this reaches a point where one or both of you become exasperated, and you just don't know what to do any longer, right? Um, everything sort of spirals down really quickly. Uh, the only peace you get is when things are either superficial or one of you is absent from the other. Just an ugly picture, right? This is an ugly, ugly picture. Um, we've got responsibility to deal with that. It right? must be dealt with. Uh, must be dealt with in a biblical way, and we must honor the Lord in our marriages. Um, we want to encourage you not to think about your marriage, problems in your marriage, or conflicts in your marriage as a zero-sum game. We want you to think about it this way. Each person has their own circle... And each circle is 100%. The wife has her responsibility. She is 100% responsible for the problems that take place in her marriage. 100% responsible for her contribution to that. 100% responsible for working on that, for resolving conflict, for going to the Bible, for repenting of sin, for praying, for leading... Um, her kids, for submitting to her husband. She's 100% responsible for her marital relationship. The husband is 100% responsible for the conflicts that take place in the marriage. 100% responsible uh, to lead his family, to love his wife sacrificially, to discipline his kids. 100% responsible for resolving conflict bi biblically. 100% responsible for repenting of sin, right? Leading the household. Each person has 100% responsibility. Uh, the example that we used last year briefly with respect to that um, was the, um, the Pulse nightclub shooting. You know, it had, had happened not too long prior to that. And uh, we talked about Omar Mateen, the, the Muslim that went in there and shot those people. Um, terrible, tragic thing. And he was 100% responsible for a vicious, heinous, wicked, deplorable, disgusting crime, right, where he murdered people in that place. But... A person who was there, who went there to sin, who was there sinning, they're 100% responsible for their actions that put them in that place at that time. They bear responsibility for having, they weren't there honoring the Lord. Right? They, weren't, they weren't there in obedience to the Lord. They bear 100% responsibility. So this is not a zero-sum game. Everybody bears responsibility. In marriage, you each have a 100% circle. Um, the husband's circle, right? We take the husband's 100%. Husbands in your circle, in your circle is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, forgiveness, Love, it all goes in your circle, right? Love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. That's in your circle. Ephesians 4.29 is in your circle. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. 
Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by, uh, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, husbands, let all anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. That's all in your circle. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Dwell with her with understanding. And because she's the weaker vessel, honor her as the weaker vessel. Right, husbands, that's all in your circle. You're 100%. You're 100% responsible to ensure that in your high, in your house, in your marriage, in your relationship, there is kindness, gentleness, self-control, love, patience, joy, right? All those things. Wives. In your circle, wives, your circle includes love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Wives, in your circle, you are to forgive your husband, see that you respect your husband, submit to your husband as unto the Lord in everything. That's in your circle, wives. Suffer long and be kind. Believe all things, bear all things, hope all things, endure all things. You see how this works, right? Both circles. You have 100% responsibility for that. Now, think about it with me. If two people are doing that, what's the likelihood of there being any conflict in the marriage? <laughs> it doesn't take much to think about, right? It's slim to none. <laughs> if one person behaves that way, it's, it's really difficult to argue with a person who is conducting themselves in that way, right? We have 100% responsibility for that. But this morning, we want to talk about, spend some time talking about, is the husband's circle, okay? We want to spend some time talking about the husband's circle, um, husbands and wives re with respect to conflict you may have sin to confront in your spouse loving confrontation is your responsibility it's in your circle well what does the, the Bible say Matthew chapter 7 verse 3 if you're going to do that then make sure you've got the plank dug out of your own eye first uh, before you deal with the speck in your brother's eye your husband's eye or your wife's eye right otherwise if you don't do that you are a hypocrite if you don't do that, you're a hypocrite, okay? You may be married to an unconverted person. Maybe your spouse is not saved. You have a 100% circle. Right? You are responsible for your circle if your spouse is unconverted. Um, I think it's extremely important to note that although, although as individuals accountable to God... Both husband and wife must take personal responsibility for laboring to maintain a godly marriage relationship. Although there are two circles, right? Although there are two circles, there is one head. There is one head. Jesus says, is, uh, as Christ is the head of the body, his bride, the church, and the husband is the head of his wife. So we want to spend some time this morning talking about the husband's circle. The husband as head. Wives, as we do this, you will... Notice ways uh, in this where you can love and respect your husband more the way that God has called you to love and respect him. Wives, you can consider as we go through this uh, ways in which you should be more submissive to your husbands. Uh, so I want you to be thinking about that. But husbands, we want to spend some time specifically talking about your circle. Um, in light of all this, right, in light of the fact that marriage is not a zero-sum game, that each person has 100% responsibility for their own circle, so to speak. Imagine that a, uh, an employee at Troy's sub shop, right, John Smith's sub, an employee of Tro Troy fails to handle the meat uh, in accord with code, and people get sick eating at John Smith's subs. Who is ultimately responsible for that? Troy is. And John Smith. <laughs> but what about the employee? Yeah, they, bear, they bear guilt. Right? But who's ultimately responsible? Troy is. A caregiver. right? A caregiver working for Dale at Senior Helpers makes a critical medication error and somebody dies. Who is ultimately responsible for that? Dale. Dale is ultimately responsible for that, right? Remember the two sons of Eli in 1 Samuel chapter 2. The two sons of Eli in 1 Samuel chapter 2 corrupt the worship of God. They make the worship of God abominable in the eyes of the people. They're sleeping with the, meet, the women who assemble outside the tabernacle of meeting, right? 
And who does God give ultimate... God kills those two boys, right? He kills them. But who is ultimately responsible for that? Eli is. And God tells Eli, listen, you esteemed your sons higher. You honored them more than me. That's what he tells Eli. And eventually he kills Eli too. All right? Paul says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Write some of these down and just go back and, and look at them. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. I want you to know, Paul says, that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. That is countercultural today. Right? And people bristle, bristle against that. But it is it can't be any clearer. I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ. The head of woman is man. And the head of Christ is God. And that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that Jesus Christ is not equal with God in his essence, in his nature, in his being. Uh, that's what we're referring to when we talk about that. We're referring to the ontological trinity. Ontologically, they are equal in their being, in their essence, in their nature, right? But it does mean, it does mean that there is an authority that the Father has executed over the Son. And that's what we refer to uh, when we talk about the economic trinity. You understand the difference between ontological or being and economic function, work. With, ref with reference to how the Father and the Son relate to one another, we're referring to the economic trinity. There is a way in which the Father has executed headship or authority, authority over the Son. Within the trinity, within the trinity, the Father is the economic head of the Son. When Christ submitted himself to the will of the Father, Christ was not inferior. Christ was somehow not unequal. He did not consider it to be robbery, uh, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, right? The Son is equal to the Father. And so this authority does not imply inferiority. They're equal, but there is an economic authority given to the Father. Both men and women, both men and women are created in the image of God. Paul says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26, he says this, listen, you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. He's talking to men and women. You are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all, we could say ontologically, one in Christ Jesus, right? We have equal value in that sense. Peter says that husbands and wives are heirs together of the grace of life, okay? However, however, economically, functionally, the husband is the head of the wife. Paul says in Ephesians 5.23, the husband is head of the wife as also Christ is head of the church and he is savior of the body. That's where Paul gets that theology from, this understanding. I want you to know, 1 Corinthians 11, 3, the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now, what's the point of all that? We've got to understand that reality, right? Women, wives, you need to understand that reality. Men, you need to understand that reality. And it's worth meditating on and thinking about. The man is head of the wife. What's the point? Everything that takes place, everything that takes place, everything that doesn't take place in a marriage, good, bad, sinful, righteous, occurs under the purview of the husband's headship and is therefore the husband's responsibility. Now think about that with me, okay? Everything that takes place, Everything that takes place, everything that doesn't take place, that should take place. Good, bad, sinful, right, wrong, righteous, unrighteous. All of that occurs under the purview of the man's headship in a marriage. And is therefore the husband's responsibility. Guys, it is your responsibility. That's weighty, isn't it? You stop to think about... Um, Maybe the things that have gone on in your marriage, <laughs> issues you've had in the past, problems that have come up, things that have happened, shouldn't have happened, should have happened, the way things were dealt with, handled, not handled. Husbands, that ultimately is your responsibility. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, your circle 
encompasses all circles. <laughs> Your circle encompasses everything. You know, if um, we would be right, we would be right when a couple comes in for marriage counseling to assume that it's entirely the man's responsibility. Husband and wife come in, they, they're thinking to themselves, she's got all these problems. She's thinking he's got all these problems. We can just get him fixed, her fixed. Everything's going to work out fine. We would be right to assume that when a husband and a wife come into marriage counseling, that it is entirely the man's responsibility. Just so we are on the same page, okay? Uh, men, you have a 100% circle with respect to this. A wife may sin. Men, your, your wife may sin. And she bears the guilt before God for her sin. She bears responsibility for her sin. Right? It doesn't take away the responsibility of that John Smith sub-employee for mishandling the meat. Right? It doesn't take their responsibility. They're guilty of doing that. But husbands, you bear the responsibility. Ultimate responsibility is with the head. Uh, Doug Wilson, um, emphasizing the one flesh nature of a covenantal marriage relationship, said this. A husband can no more blame his wife for the state of their marriage than a thief can blame his hands. Now think about that for a moment, okay? Much of this comes from Doug Wilson. Uh, there's a couple of books that Doug Wilson wrote. just really, really helpful. One's Reforming Marriage. Another one is called Federal Headship. Uh, it's really, really good. Uh, written some, some good things with respect to marriage and the family. Really, really helpful. A husband can no more blame his wife for the state of their marriage than a thief can blame his hands. Note, though, that that doesn't make the husband guilty for his wife's sin. Yeah. That's it, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we're going to get there. So we're going to keep moving. And if I don't answer specifically, Q&A it. <laughs> okay, we're going, to, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Okay. Um, all right. Doesn't make the husband guilty of his wife's sins. His wife still bears the guilt of her own sin. But um, the husband is responsible. Uh, it doesn't make the husband guilty of her sin any more than it makes Eli guilty of the sins of his sons. That makes sense? But Eli held responsible. Eli's held responsible. Um, we're talking about covenant responsibility, right? Covenant responsibility. The husband has covenant responsibility for his wife and for his marriage, for his family. This kind of covenant love is displayed most gloriously in the person and work of Jesus Christ, right? We see that most clearly in the work of Christ for those he is covenantly responsible for. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't sin your sins. Right? You're guilty of sinning your sins. You're responsible for sinning the sins that you have sinned. Jesus Christ didn't sin the sins that you sinned, but he took responsibility for them on the cross if you're in him. Right? If by faith, by repentant faith, you put your trust in Christ and you turn from your sin, then although he didn't personally commit your sins, he bore the wrath reserved for them. Right? He's the one who took, he bore your guilt, bore your shame for that sin on the tree. We don't atone for our wives in marriage. Right, men? But we seek to love her as Christ loves the church, and Christ took responsibility for the sins of his people. And he took that upon himself. And we must do that by taking responsibility for her as the Lord has done with us. In the flesh, that's really difficult to do, right? Uh, we don't want to take responsibility for her sin. Most of the time, listen, men, I don't want to be uncharitable in that. I can't say most of the time. Much of the time, in our flesh, we want to blame her for her sins. We want to level her sins upon her. We want to weigh her down with her sins. Right? When we, re we respond in the flesh, that's how we respond. Um, that's the flesh. That's natural man. Um, we want to uh, make her feel the weight of it. So to speak, in an argument, you may want to bulldoze her so that she feels the full weight of your sin. And the entire time you're heaping weight upon her, you're attempting to offload weight from your own shoulders. It's self-justifying, hypocritical, self-righteous, blame-shifting. It's what you're doing. Right, um, and guys, we can't do that. Uh, the example, I thought this one was a helpful one, is that um, husband's name is Bill. Right, husband's name is Bill. Wife's name is Sue. Their last name is Smith. Then Bill 
is responsible for Bill and the Smiths. <laughs> Does that make sense? He is, he is the Smiths. He's responsible for the entity that is the Smiths. Um, as, an indivi- as an individual, he's not only responsible for his own person, he's responsible now for this corporate entity called the Smiths. He's responsible for a marriage, a family, a wife. Paul assists us with this uh, in a text that Pastor Rick was going over this morning. Let's look at it again in Ephesians chapter 5. Um, Ephesians chapter 5. And again, this is good, guys, to spend some time uh, meditating on. And I want to give you some practical help to do that here uh, before the, uh, our time is up. But just to meditate about this a little more uh, in depth. Look at chap, uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22. So Paul says here, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. So why? Right? He tells wives, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Why? Verse 23. Because, for, because the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is Savior of the body. This is really, really convicting. And um, really convicting for the same reason that Pastor Rick pointed out in his uh, session this morning. I'm not thinking about it from the perspective of the wife, even though he's telling wives to submit. I'm thinking about it in pers- from the perspective right now of the husband as being one to whom the wife should submit. Really really convicting, right? Weighty and difficult. So men, let it rest, right? For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, and he is Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. And notice that it's not communicated in the form, this instruction regarding headship is not communicated here in the form of an imperative, a command. Um, Husbands, he doesn't say husbands, husbands, be the head of your wife. He doesn't say that, right? Husbands, you ought to be the head of your wife. Husbands, strive to be the head of your wife. It's given here as a statement of fact. It's given as an indicative, not an imperative. It's given as an indicative, a statement of fact. Husbands, he says, you are, you are the head of your wife, right? Husbands, you are the head of your wife. In our world, in our society, our culture, Lost, saved, doesn't matter. In a marriage relationship, that marriage instituted, that that institution created by God, whether the husband leads or doesn't lead, whether the wife leads or doesn't lead, doesn't all that none of that matters. The husband is the head of the wife. So there are there are significant implications for that, right? If you are a if you're a lost man and you're not leading your wife, you're gonna face accountability for that. Uh, if you're here, you're claiming to be a Christian, and you're not leading your wife, uh, you're going to stand before God, and you're going to make, give an account to that. Why? Because you are the head of your wife, right? You are the head of your family. Um, this is the nature of your relationship to your wife. The nature of your relationship is that you are the head. God has designed it that way. No matter how our culture perverts that and twists it, right? No matter how you, how many Jackson Steves get married, no matter how many domineering women marry weak limp wristed men it doesn't matter men you are the head of your wife Um, that's the nature of our relationship god has designed it that way and whether you think you are or think that you are not whether you are leading or are not leading right obeying or not obeying lazy or disciplined regardless you are leading you are leading so you're either leading by your faithfulness or you're leading by your negligence, right? Um, some husbands run away from their responsibilities, um, right? They avoid their responsibilities. They'll divorce their wife, move to another state. Um, they will neglect their wives by stupid video games until all hours of the night, watching TV, being a workaholic, which was my particular problem, right? Just those kinds of things they'll do to avoid um, avoid the marriage, avoid responsibility. You can lead by faithfulness or you can lead by negligence. Um, some, they lead by their absence. When they withdraw, um, there's a vacuum that's created. 
because now that leadership is not being fulfilled in the home. And so in the absence or in the vacuum of male headship, um, all manner of sin develops, right? Uh, something's going to lead, right? And your absence may be the thing that's dominating the home. A man's weakness may be the thing that dominates the home. A man's anger may be the thing that dominates the home. A man's absence may be the thing that dominates the home. A man's negligence may be the thing that dominates the home, right? But the man is the head of the wife, and the man is the head of the family. And it's going to be that, uh, in some capacity, that man is leading. In a husband's weakness, if you have a domineering wife at home, it is because the man is weak. And that weakness becomes an observable, obvious characteristic of that home, right? Um, his sin, his sin may become the observable evidence of a lack of headship in the home. That may be the thing that, that leads, that fills the vacuum. If the husband is a hypocrite, the husband lies about the relationship between Christ and the church. Um, he lies about Christ to his family. In other words, your leadership, man, my leadership in the home, your leadership in the home is not a choice. You are the head of your wife. And you can't escape that responsibility. You can't neglect it, shirk it, run away from it. Um, you're going to be accountable for it. Um, it's just a question. It's just a question of how you're leading where you're leading, what you're doing in that role as head. Um, you may be creating a vacuum of headship, and that vacuum then is dominating the home, okay? The vacuum is leading them. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, 3, again, I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Wilson again. Arguing with the fact of the husband's headship in the home is like jumping off a cliff in order to quarrel with the law of gravity. <laughs> Marshal the arguments on the way down, however you may like, he will eventually find himself refuted in a messy way. <laughs> right? You can't argue with gravity on the way down off the cliff. Imagine with me for a moment, right, as we think about this. Um, imagine... Men, like right now, take stock of your weakness, right? Acknowledge for a moment your um, own particular ways of sinning in your relationship, your own weakness, your own failures, all right? And think for a moment, men, how would your wife thrive or flourish in joy under more Christ-like headship. Now, I can, I can think to myself, boy, if, you know, if there were just a perfectly godly husband leading my wife, how would my wife thrive and flourish? How joyful would she be? How she would grow and mature? That should be really, really convicting. Right? I know my weaknesses, my failures, my inabilities. Uh, I know my own particular ways of sinning. Right? So think about that. Um, and then attain it, right? We have a responsibility to, we have 100% responsibility as head of our wives uh, to be a godly head. As Christ loved the church, we're to love our wives. We are head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, head of the body. All right? Let's keep going in the text. This is Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse 25. Here come the imperatives, right? Here's how then you are to exercise your headship. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So in this way, husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. So he gives two examples here of how men are to love their wives. First, verse 25, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. That's one way. The second way is just, verse 28, just as their own bodies, 
He who loves his wife loves himself. All right? So first, we're to love our wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. We talked about the covenant responsibility that the Lord Jesus Christ took for his own people. Right? He died for their sins, paid the penalty for their sins. In John chapter 12, verse 27, uh, the Lord says, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. You remember this um, text when we're going through the Gospel of John. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ coming to uh, the cross has a, an understanding of what's about to take place, right? What we see on the cross is not the fraction of it, right? Uh, you've heard the, the term synecdoche. Uh, it's a, um, a part for the whole, a part for the whole. So we see laid out on scripture, uh, laid out in scripture, or if you've seen the passion movie or things like that, you see the suffering, the physical suffering that Jesus Christ went through, his shed blood, he was marred more than any man, his visage marred more than any man. Um, we see um, the, that he was stricken, smitten, and afflicted, All right? We see that, um, but that is a part, that is a part representing the whole. What we don't see is the wrath of Almighty God poured out on Christ for that sin, for my sin, for your sin, if you're in Christ. That's the cup that had Jesus Christ in anguish, in horror, in the garden, right? That's what he was sweating great drops of blood over, right? That's what had him praying to the Father, if there's any way that this cup can be removed from me, Lord, let it happen. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Right? That is what the Lord Jesus Christ did for his bride. Can you imagine the Lord Jesus Christ complaining about his bride? Can you imagine the Lord Jesus Christ um, pointing a you know, wagging finger at his bride? Christ loved his bride with an efficacious love, right? with a working love, a cleansing love. He loved her in a way that transforms her. Verse 26, cleansing her, sanctifying her with the washing of water by the word. That's how Christ loved his bride, and that's the command we're given in verse 26, that we should love our wives that way, that we should sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. That she might be presented to Christ, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. It's in this way that husbands are to love their wives, right? He assumes responsibility for her sanctification. He assumes responsibility for her increasing godliness. The husband assumes responsibility for her increasing Christ-likeness, right? He assumes responsibility for her. Husbands are responsible for their wives. Husbands, you are the head, right? We are the head. He's not merely defined. His love is not merely defined by what he feels. But the Lord's love is defined by what he accomplishes, by what he does. We need to define our love for our wives in the same way, right? By what we accomplish in them, for them, through them. Uh, we need to have that same kind of thought process of wanting to see her more godly, wanting to see her more Christ-like. And when she's not, we bear responsibility for that. We are the head of the wife, right? Um, it's a weighty responsibility, right, guys? Secondly, we're to love our wives just as our own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, the Lord says, or Paul says there in verse 28. Which means you should care as much for the well-being and joy of your wife as you do for your own well-being and joy. Your own welfare. Right. Look at verse 30. For, because, we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason... A man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You see the, the, the similarity in the two pictures there, right? He's intentionally drawing a connection between those two. This is a great mystery, he says in verse 32, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in, a particular, uh, in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So the husband is to love. Wives, you are to respect. Um... If wives, if you, as you sit there and think about these responsibilities of your husband, um, should it not engender respect for him that he voluntarily takes on that kind of weight for you? Husbands, in marrying your wives, you took that responsibility. It is your responsibility. Now, wives, see to it, see to it 
that you respect your husbands, right? See to it that you respect your husbands. Now notice how those commands are also suited to the particular needs that we have in the relationship. It's also suited to God's design for male headship. Male, the husband needs to be respected. A wife needs to be loved, right? Women need the kind of love expressed in Ephesians chapter 5 in order to, to flourish and to thrive. Men need the kind of respect that's being called for, demanded in Ephesians chapter 5 from the wife. And wives, you are required to give it. Men, you're required to give love. Ladies, you're required to give respect. Not because, husbands, you have earned respect. And not because, wives, you've earned that love. We don't deserve it. We don't deserve it, but it's required by God that we give it. These are covenant responsibilities. Men are required to love their wives sacrificially in the ways that we've discussed. Women required to respect their husbands. So here's how male, male, male headship works then, all right? Men, your circle involves 100% responsibility for seeing that Ephesians 5, among other texts, right, are obeyed. You read a text like Ephesians chapter 5, you bear 100% responsibility for seeing to it that Ephesians 5 is characteristic of your home. It's also your responsibility to see it, see to it that Romans 13 is characteristic of your home. That 1 Peter chapter 3 is characteristic of your home, right? All these other texts. You are responsible for her role. You are responsible for your role. You're responsible for her role, and you're responsible for your role. You are the head. It's safe to assume, it's safe to assume that if there are problems in the relationship, those problems are completely your responsibility. It doesn't mean that she doesn't bear guilt for her sin in the relationship, and you must love as part of your responsibility to lovingly confront her in sin. And to lovingly deal with sin in the relationship. But you are responsible. If a man then, okay, if a man then is complaining about his wife. Now think with me, okay. If a man is complaining about his wife, he is not exercising biblical headship in the home. And worse than that, he's slandering his wife. He's gossiping against his wife. Right? Right? He, it's malice. If a man is complaining about his wife, he is not exercising biblical headship in the home. If you're complaining about your wife to yourself, under your breath, in the car, on the way to work. <laughs> listen, it's your responsibility. Stop complaining. What are you going to do about it? <laughs> yes. Yes, please, brother. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> very, very good. Yes, very good, Doug Wilson. Yeah. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Yeah, amen. Yeah, leaving the home. That's right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yep. No. And husbands have a head, too. Right? It's not just the wives. The head of the wife is the husband, though. Husbands have a head. And they need to lead in submitting to their head. So, um, Any other questions, thoughts about that? It's a bit weighty, right, guys? I, I mean, um, just leveling weight. Yes. Pardon me? Yeah, how worthwhile. Amen. Amen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, amen. You know, and thinking about that too with respect to work, let me just a little incidental aside with respect to that. 
Um, men are called to work. Men are called to work. Women, what are you called to? You're called to be his helper. So we live in a world, an age right now, where um, men and women often both work outside the home. Uh, it goes against what the Bible has taught, right? Um, sometimes that's, that's not an option. Men and women have to work outside the home. Uh, you want to work it and work toward fulfilling the um, the picture of marriage that God has instituted in his word for you and to rectify that situation uh, at virtually every cost to be able to do that. Um, but um, men work. Women, you're to help him in the work. You You are the helper. So he has a vocation, or he has a calling. Um, ladies, your responsibility is to help him in that. It's not that you are two um, functionally operating autonomous individual entities doing your own work. <laughs> As a family, men are the head. Husbands, you're the head of the house. Uh, but ladies, one of your responsibilities is to help him support, support him in his work. Uh, help him work the work that he's been called to do. Um, that's one of the ways that you respect your husband, submit to your husband. Uh, you enable him to do what he's been called to do. And you're to make it such that he can accomplish more in his work, the work that he's been called to do. Um, man, that doesn't mean that you can neglect your family, neglect your wife in your work, or that you can escape, quote unquote, in your work. Um, you, you have a responsibility to care for your family, be the head. Think with me about this, okay? A few things by way of application. Um, maybe you're married to an unbeliever. Okay, so your your spouse is not converted. Maybe, I'm just going to give you, and if these things resonate with you, I'm going to ask you in a minute to take stock of where you're at. But if these any of these resonate with you, um, think about them, write them down. Uh, maybe you're married to an unbeliever. If any of these spark a Q&A question, those cards Brian was telling you about, get those, you know, fill that out on a card. We'll talk about it after lunch. Maybe your wife, is unfaithful in her responsibilities. Wives have a responsibility to keep the home. Wives have a responsibility to prepare meals for the household. Wives have a responsibility to be managers of the, managers of the home while husbands are managing the work. Wives, that's your responsibility. Now, husbands, if your wives are working full-time out of the house, well then... <laughs> Like he said, you need to go back to a Titus 2 model for marriage or you need to pitch in then, right? I mean, it's, that, that's a situation you have put her in. And it's a, um, it's, a, it's a wicked deception of feminism in our day, uh, this whole double income, wives working out of the home. Because what it ends up doing is it ends up oppressing the wife even more. She's oppressed by a weak, limp-wristed husband and then oppressed by having to work outside the home and do things that the husband won't do in the home. So she ends up doing both, right? Don't do that to your wife, right? But um, maybe she's not being faithful in her responsibilities. Maybe she's not um, teaching the kids the way that, in the way that you understand the Bible, the way that she should be teaching the kids. Maybe she's uh, unfaithful in following the Lord, right? She's not active in commitment to the local church. So around here, she's not being faithful. Maybe she's not being faithful in evangelism. She's not being faithful in coming to small group. Maybe she's not being faithful in reading her Bible. Whatever that is, right? Think with me for a moment, right? Maybe things have deteriorated in your marriage so far to the point now that you have forfeited any ability to influence her. Because things have gotten to be the point where it's so bad that you can't lead any longer. Uh, or that she won't listen, or that it just erupts in virtual violence right? when you bring something up. Maybe um, your wife, your family, is now so spiritually malnourished because of your negligence that you don't know where to start. Maybe you've handled yourself so poorly in the past that you have lost the respect of your wife. Maybe you're concerned about the amount of money that your wife spends. Maybe you're concerned in your homes, in your home, with uh, habits of entertainment, right? How much TV she watches or doesn't watch your kids, how much they watch or don't watch, you know, right? Um, choices about that, how the home's kept. Maybe, maybe the problem is around a lack of intimacy in the home, right? 
um, how your wife views intimacy, how frequently you are or how infrequently you aren't intimate. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe it's um, how the kids are disciplined, how they're talked to. Any of those things, right? Think through, take stock of where you're at and ask yourself, what men, what are we then as heads of our households, as head of the wife, what are we then to do? What is your responsibility? You are the head of your wife. You're the head of your household. What it doesn't entitle you to do is to get angry. What it doesn't entitle you to do is raise your voice. What it doesn't entitle you to do is complain or get bitter or get resentful or resort to, you know, harsh words with your wife. It doesn't entitle you to be self-righteous or self-justifying. It doesn't entitle you to ignore the plank in your own eye. It doesn't entitle you to walk around the house stomping around like a despot or a tyrant, right? It doesn't entitle you to be that way. But what are we as the heads of our household to do practically? Let me give you some things to write down. One, confess your own sin before God and repent. If, that's, if any of that is, is the, the, the state of your home, or if there are problems like that that are just neglected, they, they've not been dealt with, then you bear responsibility, man. Confess your sin before God and repent. You bear responsibility. Acknowledge the ways in which you have contributed to the circumstances. Right? You have contributed to the circumstances. For the typical husband, that list will be lengthy. Right? Bear responsibility. Confess your own sin before God and repent. Number two, we must begin by confessing the sins of our household before God and assume full responsibility for them to the degree that your marriage doesn't reflect a Christ-exalting, God-honoring marriage. Then confess the sins of that. Confess the sins of your marriage, the, consins, the sins of your household. Like Eli should have confessed the sins of his sons. You confess the sins of your household before God and you assume full responsibility for them. You bear full responsibility for them, right? I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> As I say those words, I feel the weight, right? Feel the weight. As covenant head of your household, you men are responsible to confess the sins of your household. And so we're clear here, right? I want to be clear. Your wife is not the proverbial noisy neighbor. In other words, the problem isn't over there with her. The problem is over here with us, right? Right, men? The problem is not with her. The problem is with you. Part of your confession should be the many times that you blamed her, the many times that you failed to take responsibility, right? If you've lashed out at her, used harsh words with her, if you've ever laid a finger on her, I mean, right, we bear responsibility, men. Acknowledge your own failure to exercise your headship appropriately and accept, assume full responsibility for it. You are responsible, right? Third, run all of it, run all of it through the filter or the lens of loving your wife as Christ loved the church. You're going to confess your own sins before God. You're going to confess the sins of your household and assume full responsibility. And third, you're going to run everything that you think, everything that you're thinking about, everything that you're now contemplating working on, you're going to run that through the filter lens of loving your wife as Christ loved the church. In other words, in what you now begin to acknowledge as sin or problems or whatever the case may be, it's not because of your tyrannical scruples. Uh, but you're going to be loving towards your wife, sacrificial towards your wife. Um, needs to be run through the filter or the lens of loving your wife. Is it going to be beneficial for your wife? Is it going to be sanctifying for your wife? Is it going to be helpful to your wife to fix these things? Run it through the filter or the lens of loving your wife as Christ loved the church. Number four, when and only when you have accepted full responsibility from the heart for the spiritual condition of your home, 
when when that is understood, when it's the weight of that is felt, when you have mourned over that, when every shred of self-justifying, self-righteous blame shifting has been put off, when you've taken the nasty plank out of your own eye, in other words, then sit down and talk with your wife, right? Number four is to sit down and talk with your wife. And you need to be in a spirit in a spiritual place where you can have that conversation in a godly way. Um, you need to be spiritually capable, spiritually ready to have that kind of a conversation. Confess your sins before God. Confess the sins of your household. Assume full responsibility for them. Run it all through the filter or the lens of loving your wife. It's Christ love the church. And then when you have fully accepted responsibility, sit down and talk with your wife. Now let me give you some guidelines for that conversation, right? Some guidelines for that conversation. One is you're not going to have that conversation in an accusational way. You're not going to sit down and accuse. You're not there to accuse, right? If you, if you start accusing her, go back and repeat step number one through, really one through four. <laughs> you're, you're not there, right? You must acknowledge, you, you must acknowledge the reality of her sin. You must acknowledge the reality of her negligence, if any. You're going to acknowledge the reality of her sin. That for which she is truly guilty, but you're not going to have an accusing spirit. In other words, you're, you're not there to point out her need for repentance. You are there repenting. Make sense? You are there in a heart of repentance. Two. One, do not accuse. Two, confess your failure to her in exercising headship. Confess your negligence in loving her. Confess your failure in dealing with this. You're confessing your failure. Three, then make clear what your expectations are. So to that point, make clear what your expectations are. Do not accuse, number one. Do not accuse. You're not going there to accuse. Number two, confess your sin. Confess your failure in exercising biblical headship. Three, make clear what your expectations are for her and for your household in the future. There are things that your wife must do that you cannot do for her. You should not do for her. They're not your responsibility. Uh, you cannot tolerate a lapse into old ways of doing things. This is the time for change, a time for repentance, a time for moving forward. This is a tough conversation, right? Um, gently explain that these are things or that this is something that must be done. In this conversation, you have to exercise patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, self-control. And you're not as much pointing to her or pointing her to repentance as much as you are exhibiting the fruits of repentance here. Four, you must have plans or something in place for regular checks, regular communication, regular prayer, regular Bible study regarding these things. Um, it is the old adage, you have to inspect what you expect, right? And if you neglect that which you expect, <laughs> it's not going not gonna to happen. Oh, yeah. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. So you have to inspect what you expect. And so you need time together. You need time together where you're communicating with one another, where you're talking about these things. Um, and again, men, you cannot lose control. You cannot be angry. You cannot be bitter. You cannot be resentful. You cannot sin. You cannot sin, right? You are the head of your wife, the head of your spouse. You're the head of your family. Five, keep it broad and representative. In other words, uh, this is not a 25-year uh, list of grievances that you have collected over time. We're not to keep a record of wrongs. Uh, this is not a uh, individual thing. Well, you did this in 1986, and I was really, and I've never forgiven you for it. Right? Not anything like that. Um, it's a representative list of necessities. So let me give you an example of what I mean by that. Um, let's say that uh, your wife, your wife, is responsible for keeping the house, keeping the house, and the house just isn't clean. House isn't clean, right? This is an example, representative thing. You can pick any number of things. The house isn't clean. So you come to your wife 
And it's like, you didn't dust in 1986, and you didn't dust in 1987, and you didn't prepare meals in 1988, and you didn't do laundry in 1989. Um, it's like, honey, uh, put your words to this. The house isn't up to par here. And we need to do, uh, you don't even need to use a we. You need to do a better job of maintaining the house. What that may look like is 13 things. You're not going to give 13 things because 13 things will overwhelm her. Uh, You're going to work slowly over time. You're going to give her one thing, right? Let's work on doing the dishes after the meal, right? Or let's work on doing laundry a little bit through the week so we're not piling up over three weeks and doing it all at once, right? Um, Whatever that is, whatever that is. But you're going to give her a representative list of necessities so she's not overwhelmed. Um, And then, let me remind you, if she's working full-time, or if she's working part-time, if she's working, then you're going to have to take that into consideration. You're going to have to talk through that, right? Um, if she's working, you're going to have to talk through that. Ladies, let me ask you in this. We're thinking practically here. What if one of the necessities that he brings up isn't a necessity that you think is a necessity <laughs> and you disagree with his necessity? He says the home is not being kept up. And you say... I think the home is being kept up. (laughs) What do you do? Well, I would lovingly ask him, in what way do you think the home is not being kept up? And you need to endeavor to meet that standard. Wives, you are to submit to your husbands. Husbands, you are to love your wives. But ladies, you are to submit to your husbands. I don't want to, example, right? I don't want to plan and cook meals for my household to have dinner together at night. You may not want to. (laughs) But what are you to do? You are to submit to your husband. He says that's important. That's what you do. Right? You submit to him. I remember a um, long time ago, I was having a conversation with a husband and a wife, and that was the issue. He was so angry at her for myriads of things, but when it all boiled down to, it's just she didn't cook. <laughs> she didn't cook. And it's like, man, if you could have a happy marriage, and the thing that made it happy was you're just going to cook a meal you know, a few times a week, would you do it? It's like, yeah, all day. <laughs> yes, I'll gladly cook. Um, so it's amazing uh, how those little things matter, you know. All right. You keep a, keep it broad, keep it represented. Let me give you a rundown um, so you remember, okay? First, the four steps. The four steps. Men, you're going to confess your own sin before God and repent. You must begin confessing the sins of your household and assuming full responsibility for them. Three, you're run, running all through the filter of the lens of loving your wife as Christ loved the church. Four, when you have assumed full responsibility from the heart for the spiritual condition of your home, then you're going to sit down and have a conversation with your wife. That conversation with your wife has certain guidelines that you need to remember and to be very careful to follow if you love her. Do not accuse, number one. You're not going there to accuse. You are going there to acknowledge your failure, acknowledge your sin, right? Acknowledge your neglect. Don't have an accusing spirit. You're not talking about her negligence. You're talking about your failure, right? Two, Confess your failure in exercising headship. Confess your failure in negligence or in loving her or in dealing with this. Three, make clear your expectations. What you expect her to do. And ladies, be receptive, right? Be receptive of that. Uh, don't couch terms, right? I'm, I'm even out of, I'm more inclined to use words like we. No, nope. really don't use words like we. Use words like you. Right, um, Ladies, you can use words like you with your husband. Husbands, you need to be able to use words like you with your wife. <laughs> um, you must have plans for. You must have plans for regular checks, communication, prayer, Bible study, readings, uh, to keep up with that, right, and to keep making progress, slow and steady progress moving forward. Five, keep it broad and representative. Don't, don't overwhelm your wife, right? Ladies, don't overwhelm your husband. All right. If she responds well, I'm drawing to a close here. If she responds well, then keep moving ahead with patient, slow, determined effort over time, right, until issues are resolved. You keep moving ahead. What if she does not respond? What if her, she responds with a temper? What if she resists? Then, without anger without bitterness, without resentment, without sin, in other words. Confront her in that. Confront it as rebellion. If she does not repent, does not respond well, 
And at some point, I think it warrants help from the church. You may have another couple that you feel comfortable with helping in that regard, or it may you may believe that it rises to the level where you need an elder a pastoral visit, right? An elder to be involved to help you with that. And that's what we're here for. So if it gets to the point where she does not respond, at some point you may need a visit from an elder. And remember, all of this, all of this, men, every bit of this is your responsibility. <laughs> your responsibility. If the leadership of your home has collapsed or has failed, that's on you. Right? If the leadership of your home, the governance of your home, the way that your home is operating, if that in any way has broken down or failed, that is your responsibility. Okay? So here's what I want you to do. We're already out of time, and I want to get you uh, away to lunch. Um, just real quick, men, you've got your little worship folders there. Uh, ladies, you can be thinking about this too. I want you to um, think just briefly, quickly. This will get the juices flowing, so to speak. I don't want it to just stop here. I want you to do this when you get home. Um, what sin are, have you committed against your wife, against your marriage, against your household? What sin? And again, that's going to be a lengthy list. I want you to start off with that thing that is staring you in the face. Right? The thing that is staring you in the face. In what way have you sinned against your wife in your role as head? Ladies, while they're thinking of that, you can be thinking, what way have you neglected to submit to your husband? What way have you neglected to respect your husband? What way in, have you neglected in meeting the expectations that your husband has for you as his wife? What way have you sinned in that? Okay. So, men, as you're thinking of that, generally speaking, there's there's something that's right. <laughs> Staring you in the face doesn't take half a day to come up with that. So I'm going to move on. Men, the next thing you want to do, and again, this is just the starting point, is um, confess the sinful state of your household. In what way is your marriage, What way? in what way is your household um, not measuring up? <laughs> Weigh it right now in the balances and... In what way do you find it wanting? <laughs> Confess the sinful state of your own house. All right, and then lastly, I want you to think about this, ladies. This is specifically for you. Um, knowing that, all right, God, men, you're going to stand before God and you're going to give an account. Ladies, knowing that this is the responsibility that husbands have for you, the responsibility that husbands have undertaken voluntarily for you to be your husband, then what manner of respect and love and submission do you think is due him? Knowing that this is the responsibility that your husband has, that that weight is on his shoulders, then what manner of respect, love, and submission do you think is due to him? One of the reasons that the Lord says, right, that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, but it's also thinking of the weight of that responsibility, one of the reasons that the Lord says, ladies, right, submit to your husbands in everything as unto the Lord see that you respect your husband. Um, you owe him respect. You owe him submission. Right? It's required by the Lord. Same way, husbands, you've got the weight of this responsibility on your shoulders. Right? And let's um, pray that the Lord will help us do all this. It's a, that is a tall order, right? All right. Well, hopefully that will get you started. Um, but again, this is only a starting point. Um, I think we need to go home and do some homework, right? <laughs> I pray that we all would and that um, we'll have marriages that honor the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, uh, thank you, Lord, for this time together to think through your word, uh, the weight that that um, brings upon us, the very weighty responsibility that you've given us. Lord, help us um, to see that, um, to see it and how you 
have loved us and have given yourself for us, um, how you shed your blood on Calvary, how you bore the wrath of God for us, how you now freely give us all things, how you sanctify us and cleanse us and conform us into your image, how you instruct us and correct us and rebuke us and encourage us and comfort us and love us. Lord, help us to love our wives in that way. Lord, help us to take responsibility, to assume full responsibility for the entity that is our marriage, the entity or the institution that is our family, that you have gloriously defined, gloriously designed, and help us to honor you in it. Um, Lord, help us to take those measures that we need to take. Help us to grant um, that we would be incredibly convicted over our failures, incredibly convicted over uh, what is often a reactions in the flesh or a loss of self-control or anger or bitterness or resentment or unforgiveness, um, please, Lord, uh, convict us uh, over that. Uh, Grant us genuine repentance. Help us to mourn our sin against you and the sin against against our wives, our families, or help us to bear the responsibility that you've given us to have a marriage that pictures Christ and the church, the relationship of Christ to his bride. Help us to love our wives in this way, to love our families in this way. Help us to love you in this way and to be um, testimonies of your grace. We know that apart from you, this is gloriously impossible, uh, Lord, and that uh, it's only possible. We are only capable um, by virtue of your spirit at work in us to bring us to this. Uh, God, so I pray um, we are uh, woefully and hopelessly shamefully uh, unable uh, to do any of this apart from you. So please help us. Uh, We need help in it. Uh, Help my brothers uh, to be the godly men, the godly husbands, the godly fathers that you've called us to be. Help my sisters to be the respectful, submissive, loving wives that you've called them to be. And help us in all of this, Lord, to, to honor you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. 